Now, from this point forward, I'm a little bit nervous <laughs> about about I'm telling you the, the whole story. If you think it was intimate and open before, you know, I want to keep it. I want to keep it. You know, some things are sacred, but I'm sharing this story because it is sacred. We say some things are sacred, and then we don't talk about it. But that's what we should be talking about, because it's sacred, and it, it matters. That's what means something in life. And I've been talking a lot about about you know my dreams and my my goals and my life, you know, projecting my myself as as this brand. Chad Mark Manny unto the world and and up until up until this point that's really what I was mainly concerned with in life you know but there was but first of all here I am you know as an American a formerly patriotic American who turned quite the opposite now deciding to to leave his country become an expat move to Europe I remember when when I got to the point of seeing the truth about 9-11 and, and seeing the truth about uh, the Iraq war and, and the lies and everything else. And I remember one time I was walking beneath a, a huge American flag and it was a symbol that always meant so much to me. And in that moment, it was a symbol I feared and hated. And I had spent many years, I'd say three or four years, passionately trying to change the world, argue with people, convince them, protest even sometimes. Um, and, and not that I really thought I, I was going to change the world, but I thought, but what I did learn is that it's impossible as, as an individual with this system, uh, with the brainwashing of everyone else through the media to make any kind of point that doesn't go along with the narrative. Nearly impossible to find anybody who would, who would talk with you about these things. So I kind of, I guess I kind of gave up um, I hate to say it now because I consider myself an American patriot, but back then I sure as hell didn't. And I turned my back on my country and I just needed a way out. It was, it was killing me. No excuse. I should have fought harder. I should have said, I guess. And the, and the whole thing is these should have. And now we're going to get into a, a segment of these talks that it's all about should have. You could, you could take it there. You could say, well, that shouldn't have happened or I should have done this, but that's not my life. That's not the story of my life. In this talk, we're going to get into some really difficult topics involving sex, jealousy, and things like this. And I take no pleasure, personally, in going through this. I'm doing it only because I feel like th these topics, the topic of jealous, sexual jealousy, is breaking up so many f families so much suffering in this world because of this this because people are not able to deal with their sexual jealousy and they're sexually frustrated and it comes down to a lot of sex this is kind of beneath the surface of our lives you know we have our our you know, we're worried about money we're trying to make something, something of ourselves to impress people to project an image to make sure people like us we're so concerned about what our parents think of us and our siblings and our friends and our colleagues and our spouse in my case, and yet under the surface, there's a very real thing, which is called like a sex drive. And it, we're supposed to be, I should be embarrassed to talk about it, right? I should be embarrassed to, to suggest that there's something beyond this perfect story with Eva, this perfect wife, Chad and Eva, this beautiful romantic story of falling in love with the, um, exchange student and against all odds getting married going alone going out there in the world together making something of ourselves getting our degrees you know getting good jobs there was something all along under the surface that was extremely huge and that was i had such a strong sexual desire for other women 
I can't even, there's no word to describe the level of complete on fire, going crazy. And I didn't understand it. I thought, I guess I thought it was normal. Maybe it is normal. I don't know. But for me, it was, it was extremely real. Probably my whole marriage, even though I was with an attractive woman, she was still very attractive at age 30. And even though our sex life was good, we had sex often. I was obsessed with the idea of another woman. Not anyone in particular, just the idea that it would be a different woman. And throughout our marriage, I am, I should say, I'm ashamed to say, but again, I'm not going to, well, I'm, I'll just leave it at that. What did happen for 12 years of our marriage up until this point is many, many times during sex, I would vocalize some fantasies about other women or about threesome. I was obsessed with the, with the idea of a threesome. Okay, completely obsessed. I'm probably not alone in this. Nobody talks about it, but I think a lot of men who enjoy sex, who have, who have a huge sex drive, the idea of a threesome is kind of the ultimate, right? With, with, two, with two women, of course. And so I would, obviously she knew. <laughs> she not only knew. I wouldn't shut up about it. And every time, and it got to where she went along with not objecting or like going along with a fantasy a little bit. But then after sex, she would be hurt, you know, every time. And I'm like, you know, it was just fantasy. I didn't really mean it. And I'm sure that couples do this. And no one says it. Um, the problem was there was a real need. And sometimes on a couple occasions, I remember one exactly. Um, when I was going through that last phase in Seattle, where I was, you know, the hipster sort of alternative ideas and all the reading and all the stuff. One of the ideas I came across was polyamory. Because Eva refused to even think about, to even entertain the idea or explore in any way uh, the idea of actually having a threesome with someone just you know, just for the sex. Um, so I don't know what to do. I didn't. I didn't want to cheat on her. I knew that would. I knew that was a really big deal in our relationship. I well, first of all, I had no space away from her, but it never really occurred to me that I'd be the kind of person who would cheat and lie. I was always an honest person. I was very open and good. And I didn't feel like these, this fantasy was something that was dark and wrong. I'm not talking about hurting people or I'm not talking about prostitution. I'm not talking about something that's disgusting and wrong. I'm talking about, you know, people who are, who are out of their own free will, um, you know, consensual sex because you want to and it feels good and it's fun. And I thought at the time, um, especially after we had been through so much together, that, hey, could you try it once? If I can find someone, would you try it once? Now, if you run, run out of the room crying, if it doesn't work, <clears throat> you know, I understand. And I, I love you forever for trying. And the answer was, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. I'll think about it. And every time it was, I'll think about it. And this went on for 10 years. And then I gave up on the idea that she was actually thinking about it or whatever. But she was just extremely conservative. And I understand. I'm sure most women obviously feel the same way. She was jealous. She loved me. She couldn't bear the idea of me touching another woman. And I understand but what about those feelings? What about those uncontrollable feelings that no matter what I would do, and I don't, I'm not going to get into detail about what I did to cope with that, but you can imagine. Um, no matter what I would do, there's no release until like I needed this, I needed something to happen. I was happy with my life, basically, you know, um, no complaints, you know. But there was this strong desire, this strong, strong need. 
And looking back on it, I think it was probably just the fact that I got married too young. You know, I haven't been with women before. I've been with, I never had sex with anybody besides Eva. And I was 17 when that happened. And I've been with only her, touched only her for all those years. And when I came across the idea of polyamory, I realized that maybe I'm polyamorous. You know, the idea that that you can love more than one person, you can be friends with more than one person but, and have sex with more than one person, that it doesn't take away your feelings from one to be with the other, that, that jealousy is something you can control and you can manage. And I don't think it's a terrible idea, even to this day. Um, it does kind of address a reality that a lot of people feel, that, you know, this monogamy is really difficult for a lot of people. Um, the idea that you have to be with one person until you die. And you made that in a marriage, you know, you, you swore before God and before your wife and or husband that you will not have a need to touch anyone else. And when you make such a promise, it becomes forbidden. And something so pleasurable that's forbidden becomes an obsession. And the only way that I was, you know, I... I was, it wasn't like I was thinking about it every day, but it was like it was there all those years. And when I told her about, you know, that I was polyamorous, I actually put out a profile on some kind of a site and was chatting with a girl who was also polyamorous. And, and she invited me to like, let's go to a party and just meet other people that are alternative and see what happens. And so I told my wife, I told Eva that I'm polyamorous and it's true. I'm not taking it back. If you can ever imagine um, a Category 6 hurricane, that's what I went through that weekend. You know, two do uh, probably two solid days of things flying at me, physically abused, verbally abused, emotionally abused, until the point that I said, what? Never mind, I didn't mean it. Never mind, I guess that strong need that I had, which... Um, I've been trying to tell you about for 10 years and that I was willing to go through two days of hell for so that you know the truth about me and, and try to accept me for who I am. I had to endure two, two days of hell. So never mind. I don't want to end my marriage over this stupid thing. I'll figure something out. I don't know. And so after some weeks of, you know, all these problems, I can't believe, I can't believe you said that. I can't believe... You can't believe it. I've been telling you for ever since we got married, I've been telling you this stuff. And it wasn't like, like I said in the, in the first talk or second, um, I didn't plan this. I didn't plan for this to happen. I, I thought that I just wanted to be with her and I'd be freaking happy. But obviously getting to that point, 28 years old, 29, 30, it was like I realized I was at least self-aware enough to know that I wouldn't be able to live my whole life and not touch another woman. And, that, and that's a weird place to be. I, I loved Eva. I didn't want to, to lose her. I didn't want to leave her. I didn't want to hurt her feelings at all. In fact, I thought it would be fun. I thought that a threesome, I think, I think, I thought, I believed fully that if she could let herself go, drop her ego, um, it might be a lot of fun and, and enjoyment. And of course, I was fair. Of course, in my mind, if she's willing to do that, I'm willing to also you know, make our relationship non-monogamous from my side, she'd be free as well. Well, she didn't want that. She wasn't asking for that. She didn't have that need. She had a need that everyone thinks we're perfect, that her husband behaves perfectly, that she can buy whatever clothes she wants to buy. You know, that, every, of course, all of her needs, um, I, I, I met. Everything she expresses, her needs, even, you know, a $1,000 handbag, I bought. And her needs were met. And I was, and I, and I fully recognized that this need of mine was probably impossible for a lot of people, but so is, so is unconditional love. So is a happy marriage. And, and so I guess we're getting at a point that I think a lot of people understand, but don't say because they're scared of somebody. They can't say it. That I think this issue that I faced is not that uncommon. And I think it is the end of, if not almost all or most, many relationships end because of this, this conundrum. 
So, I, you know, so what do you do? You can try to tell yourself, oh, you're, you're a bad person, change, but but it just, it, it, I wasn't able to. And maybe I was just, I was over-sexualized from, from the culture, from porn or whatever, but I didn't know a way out of, of that feeling of, of how badly I wanted this. And when I went to Slovakia, it wasn't about, it wasn't consciously about the fact that I wanted other women. Of course, it wouldn't make any sense for me to move across the world to her country and then take a risk and cheat on her over there. Um, but it wasn't my plan. I thought I'll be happy. I thought we'll travel, we'll fall in love differently, we'll have more fun, we'll have those family times, we'll be in the beautiful coast, you'd say, with the, the old town and the, and the main street and the cafes and life is going to be beautiful and I can write books and I can play guitar. And, and so, so off we went to Europe together. She wasn't thrilled about the idea at all because she's from here. And she actually, I didn't tell you the last talk that she actually got her master's degree in psychology well, I, during those previous five years in Seattle. And, you know, there was this thing, is she going to go and practice psychology, which means like your internship for two years, making almost no money. Um, and here I go, like, let's move to Europe. Well, so I kind of ended that story. She could, now she could have practiced therapy in, in, in Europe as well, I, I suppose, if that had been what she really wanted. But no, she just wanted the money from, from the, the job at drugstore.com. So she did not pursue that. And, and there was some resentment about that, I'm sure. Um, it didn't take long when we got to Slovakia. Um, we, we, found, we found a beautiful apartment in the old town in a building built in like 1880 uh, kind of remodeled a bit but still kind of creaky and like I felt like a king in that place it was just the high ceilings those old windows at night it was just magic to hear the, the people on the street in a district where there's no cars just people walking by high-heeled shoes or people laughing drinking outside partying uh, concerts things happening around it was just my dream come true as an American, that's like, it feels so exotic. You just can't believe it's your life. You know, that first summer we came here in May and then we went to London for a week and we just worked in an apartment. We worked at night. We worked U.S. hours. I started work at about 3 p.m. and ended at about 11, um, which at first at that age, it was kind of okay because I could do stuff during the day and and then we could have a, we could have some wine and some and some snack at the end of the day and stay up till one and then sleep until nine or 10 or whatever we didn't have kids so it was, it was a wild time it was really really awesome we took our took our computers and our phones went to london or went to i forgot where else we went um to con we went to con you know for a month in france and stayed by the beach and, and and worked it was amazing and could go to the beach all day and then work in the evening i didn't i wouldn't do it now because it's hard for me to at night to do anything at this age but back then it was it was awesome i guess once you become a parent it's different right um wasn't long after we got to Slovakia though that I started seeing a lot of really sexy girls. <laughs> um, you know, exotic, skinny young girls. Um and those problems became even more of a problem for me. It got to the point where I was obsessed with every waitress in every cafe. despite the fact that I was happy with my with my wife. By the way, we also I also had a lot of fun. I met a I met a, a friend, um, American friend in a town nearby. His name was Kevin. We played guitar every every Saturday. We he would drink beer all the time. He was he he was an alcoholic. And um we would have about 12 beers and he'd come over at about 10 in the morning. We'd just start playing guitar until about 6 p.m. <laughs> so he was like me in the sense that he wrote his own songs. He was a singer, you know, singer songwriter, better guitarist than me. And we just every every Saturday played together. I, of course, I played on my own. I wrote my own songs, and and I actually, um, yeah, I was taking music more seriously, writing a lot of songs, practicing, getting better. And he made me better when we played together. And eventually, we we. Um, we did an album. If you want to check, if you want to check out the, the sound of that, it's very amateur but kind of cool, good songs. This, the The band is called Sun God Abscondo, and wherever you find music, you can listen to our two albums. We played some live 
gigs and pubs and things like that. So I was starting to have more fun in that sense. There was no problem, you know, except for the fact that I haven't touched another woman. <laughs> it sounds completely selfish. I guess it is. I don't know. But I tried to talk to Eva one more time. I said, look, what are we going to do? These needs are not going away. Can you let me do something? Can we, is there, do you have any ideas <laughs> that would re relieve this tension I'm feeling, this, this need? No, nothing, just stop it. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to hear about it. So the only conclusion I, I, after 12 years of frustration, I'm not complaining, just telling you how it went. The person who would never cheat decided, I guess I have to cheat. I'll just cheat. I just won't tell her. I won't hurt her. What, what she doesn't know is not going to hurt her, right? That's what I thought. And I knew nothing about reality. So, to make matters worse, she had a job where she occasionally, like every month or two, every two months, let's say, would travel back to the U.S., to Florida. She was doing home shopping network. She was helping with launching products and she actually went to the studios and everything else. And for her, that was awesome. She loved it. For me, I was like, she's gone for a week. <laughs> Here I am, young 30-year-old, pretty fit, decent-looking guy in a dream apartment, American. And, you know, you have MySpace. You have, yeah, it was MySpace at that time for me, 2005. And I thought, here we go. We have some fun. My first lover um, was someone I met. She was, a, she was a student, an older student, a little bit younger than me, but older, older for a student. Um, and not a beautiful woman in the sense that, you know, makeup and hair, nice body. And we got along really well. We walked around town for a while. And I invited her back to my flat. She asked me to play a certain, a certain, um, well, music that I, that I happen to have, <laughs> and candlelight, and she couldn't believe that I was into her, and um, it was everything I had fantasized about for twelve years times a hundred when it finally happened. Nothing could have prepared me for how powerful and strong that type of sexual relationship is. I'm sure most of you, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, but when it's, but some people maybe don't. And I, I say this because you should know. You should know that there's power that you can't control. You can't control the addiction you have to the person, the connection you create. The, the fact that what you never expect is that you want more. You just want more. And I think it was just the forbidden nature of it that makes it a hundred times more, more wild and intense. And so this went on for a couple days and I had changed. I had become a different person. As a lover, certainly. As a romantic partner, certainly. I'm not. I'm not saying worse. I'm saying that I. I. I finally became, like, what. Well, what you would become if you had had multiple partners and you and you experimented a little bit during the, during your college years, right? You become more, just a different a different lover, a different person. And when Eva came back, I wasn't going to tell her, right? I didn't tell her. She knew right away. Because I was different. I made love differently. I think the very first day back, um, it was so obvious to her. And I didn't deny it very well. And as intense as as the previous few few nights had been, and, and all the horrible fights we had been through in the past, this was different. This this fight, it wasn't a fight, it was like our hearts stopped. The love had had gone from our from our relationship, 
It was a fight. Yeah, there were things thrown. There was, you know, there was wine smashed across the whole kitchen, all over the walls. And it was the most violent. Well, many of these nights happened, in the, you know, from that point forward with her. But I had to leave. She made me leave. I went to a hotel. And I think for, it was about three nights, three days and three nights, neither of us moved from bed. What had been the most amazing discovery for me, the most, the, the most amazing experience that I needed to happen for me, had now become absolute hell. I could not speak, I could not work, I could not move from bed. And she, she was the same way. I never understood the power. Um, I don't think it was the sex as much as the lie. Even though, strangely enough, when I think about it now, what, you know, there wasn't much of a lie. It was like the first day back she, she knew and discovered the truth and I didn't deny it. And I told, and I told her what happened. So there actually was no lie. I, I think even before that, there was, I did, she said something about maybe you should just cheat when I was asking for all these solutions. So it wasn't like, it wasn't like totally out of left field. It was almost like she must have known it was coming in a way. And I didn't lie. I didn't tell her while it was happening or before it happened. I didn't even know the girl until she had already left for the trip. And then she came back in the first day. Yeah, I told her. So it wasn't really cheating, was it? What I told her is that this girl was open to a threesome. And that's why, and that's one of the reasons why I thought we could we could heal the whole situation. Let me show you, Eva, what it's like. Now I know it's totally naive. I'm sure anybody out there is cringe. The cringe already, I'm sure you're beyond cringe. You're not even listening anymore, thankfully. But if you are listening, it's because you can relate or because somehow this relates in your life or touches you in some way. But um, I didn't see I didn't see this outcome. I just thought there'd be some fighting again, and and we'd kind of break that that barrier of that taboo, that impossible idea of you know my peepee -pee being touched by somebody else. <laughs> I thought that, and however this turns out, I'll take a risk. I'll be honest. And we'll have moved forward beyond that. But I don't know whether... I, well, obviously, it was her reaction. She looked at me like, a, like I'm a mass murderer. Like I'm guilty of, of, of... There's no bigger sin. Now, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not saying I should be off the hook for this. I'm just explaining what happened and why. And I loved her completely. I did not want to be with the other woman I was always open with anybody else who I was with. I was 100% open that I'm not going to leave Eva. It's not what this is about. It's just for fun. And we did have fun. And so what do you do? You're three days into total depression. And the only solution that comes to mind is you have to you just obviously apologize and say it'll never happen again. Like I always did. Whenever I expressed a need or we talked about this topic, it'll never happen again. And I mean it. Every time I say it, I meant it. But what happened is we, yeah, we eventually made up. She said she'll forgive this one time. It's everything changed about our relationship. There was a certain sadness to it now. Um, the innocence was just gone. You know, not that there was much left to begin with, to be honest. Um, for for whatever reason, I don't know. I, I guess I chose the absolute wrong person, even though every, the passion was there and the and the life values were the same and everything else. But we didn't map map up in terms of sex. We, you know, she was she's extremely jealous and possessive, and I'm not. I'm the opposite, and it changed the way she she felt about me. But she still wanted a life together with me, and she tried tried to be nice to me and. And, and, and go on with things. The problem is I had tasted something that I wanted more of. And after a few months went by, 
I thought, well, now I'll become a cheater. I tried it, everything I possibly could. But now this time I just won't tell her. Now I now I can handle the emotions. Like this is like any criminal activity. You know, people just keep stealing until until they get caught, right? Or, or gambling, you just keep gambling, and you know, and you, it's a typical behavior when you go off course, when you're severely off course. And anytime you think about lying to someone who you love, you're going off course. You're you're definitely creating suffering. And it's going to end in crisis because you're going so far off the course of reality, which is truth and honesty and openness. And what happened is I went back to the same girl when she had a trip, some kind of trip again. It was great again. It was amazing again. And this time I didn't tell her. And this time she didn't find out. And so... That girl ended up, you know, meeting somebody else and calling it off. Didn't want to see me anymore. Great. No problem. And there's other girls out there, right? So I had this new sport, this new hobby. Um, seducing girls. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that being an expat living in your, in your wife's country. She's off on a business trip. You know. Everything is working in our favor. We have all the money in the world. We have income. We have jobs. We have status. We have our youth, the whole life ahead of us. And I fall into this addiction, and I'll call it addiction now, this unhealthy addiction, very unhealthy addiction, of seducing girls for my ego's sake. I mean, I'm not saying I didn't, I didn't physically enjoy everything and and make a lot of amazing friendships, temporary, amazing, deep connections with people. But the truth is, if you want to cheat, understand this clearly. You will never be happy because what happens is you create this other life. I had this rich other life. I, I, I had sometimes four or five girls at once that I was writing to, uh, you know, emailing or, what, or MySpace. And, and, and meanwhile, pretending to be working, my wife in the same room. And I'm alt tabbing, and I'm pretending I'm writing an email, and and just the, the the degree of difficulty even was absurd. But knowing things that people tell you that you're not supposed, like how did you know that about a certain town in Slovakia, or about things that are the people do, or whatever? Like where are you getting all this information? Why are you telling stories about things that that? <laughs> how should you know about this? And I was able to, oftentimes go two years without her catching me. Um, but what happened is I never really enjoyed my, my real life anymore. Um, it was like a caricature. I would, I would go through the motions. I'd go visit her family and be the same old Chad. But I didn't feel... I was bored with it. I was bored with my real life. And... Sometimes I would, even in a moment of happiness when things were nice and I was enjoying the moment with, with Eva or doing something on a trip, we would go to the, ho to the hotel for the weekend, to the, to the wellness and swim and go to the saunas and be, have you know, the romance and everything else. And I would see it as almost a nightmare because I knew that it was all temporary. I knew that I couldn't stop what I was doing. And I would eventually get caught. And so even when you're in that romantic moment with a woman you love and you still love her and want to be with her forever, there's a certain sadness to it. There's like you're watching a movie that you know the ending is, isn't good. And that's not how it should feel when you're, when you're with your partner. And... Looking back on it, you know, why was that need so strong that I couldn't quit? Obviously, I had my adventures. I'm not going to tell you the number of people, but enough. Sometimes I would have, you know, two different 
girls one 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 weekend and one the next weekend, right? Or one would leave and I and I would be crying. And that's the thing. I would get so emotionally involved. It wasn't just sex. It was like emotional relationships that were actually quite intense and, and deep and getting to know each other and falling in love. I, I fell in love with some of these these women and would cry when when the weekend is over, the night's over, whatever. And and then to make myself feel better, I would go online and chat with a different one. <laughs> Because it was an addiction. There was a hole in my soul, and I didn't know the way out alone. I couldn't tell Eva because that would risk everything. My whole life would fall apart. We had agreed that no, that was the one time and no more. But here we did it again. And what do I tell her? The whole truth and all the girls or what? What do I tell her? And so you just dig this hole for yourself. Your thoughts and your feelings are, are sometimes shifting towards someone else. You're missing that person a lot. You know, I'm wondering, when's she going to leave again? <laughs> so I can see this other person. And you become this, this shady, disgusting person. Totally ego-driven. Ego and, and you're not happy. So you look even more to that, to that escape from your misery that that night that night with someone new or someone else even even though none of these women were at the standard or the level of Eva as a woman in looks or intelligence or you know I shouldn't say intelligence but um, it wasn't like I, they were better than Eva in any way let's put it that way and sometimes not even close sometimes I would just take anybody that's the sad part um what was what was the need i mean i have to i have to i have to looking back on it i have to think to myself i have to understand that something was missing in our relationship you know and i think what it was is unconditional love i think that i am not polyamorous but i am a person who needs needs to be loved unconditionally because i know what love is I know what unconditional love is, which means no matter what you need, no matter who you are, no matter what you feel or think, I love you. And in my in my view, I think I felt on some level that because she was so unwilling to take seriously my feelings and my needs, I was lonely in that relationship. I was suffering and lonely. And and not understood, and the and the strange thing is the other women did provide that. So the other women women weren't were not planning a future with me, right? Right up front, it was like it's just for fun. And so now we could talk about anything. We can talk totally honestly about everything, about Eva. About I, they even knew that I had other girls. I knew who their boyfriends were. Whatever it was, deep open relationships that were so much more rewarding and fulfilling than what I had with Eva because there were so many rules of what I could and couldn't say, what I could and couldn't do. And it felt really freeing and amazing to be able to be me and to be and to be wanted for, for who I am. And when you have a woman that you're dedicating your life to, you know, you have a shared bank account and you're doing everything and you're sacrificing to do things with her family or whatever and she's not loving you unconditionally what is she loving then she's loving the story she's loving the image i project the ego version of me that the world knows to be me she's not loving me the person in a sense because there's a limit to her love and if there's a limit to love it's not love it's not it's not unconditional love it's not the kind of love that just is without question that goes on for a lifetime and apparently it wasn't the kind of love that would that could fully keep me happy. I did want that kind of love with Eva. I did want Eva. I wanted her to accept me, to forgive me, to see that I'm not a bad person, that what I did wrong was this web of lies. And I did all the web of lies only because of her feelings. I suffered... On that level, my entire life was suffering, despite some occasional escapes and mountaintop highs that, that come down the next day to like a low just as far. Um, but I did all that. 
all that crazy plotting I've done. I won't even, I, I cannot get into the stories. It's just not right. But I've taken trips. I've taken a trip 10 hours away with one girl. I brought my whole phone system with I mean, just madness. Things I, I did. I took a fake business trip to, to, to the UK. The company didn't even know I was there and ever thought I had to go for business, but I went to meet somebody. Nuts. Nuts behavior with a wife at home. I was, out, I was spinning out of control with no end in sight. And after a couple years of this, she did catch me. I don't remember. A few times she caught me. And every time it was about, you know, a year and a half or two more years and the same cycle would repeat. I would swear on my life that I'll never do it again, that I'm done with it, that now that, she, and I said, now that you under, now that you know what happened, now that you can, um, there's no more secrets between us, now I feel closer to you. And we would go through, especially this first time when she knew that I was a serial cheater, a horrible, disgusting, lying sleaze bag. Um, we had days and days of conversation where I told her basically everything. And the funny thing is that during, during that time, we finally felt close. She understood. She's like, well, that must have been fun, actually. I mean, sometimes it got to the level of like, that feeling of, of hope that we can be together, that, that you, can, you can forgive me, that you can understand me. And we would get after some, probably after some drinks though, we would get to the point where, where it feels like it's all, it's perfect. Everything is freaking perfect. Now I'm done with this lying and you accept me and I don't need it anymore. I've already done enough. And we, it was ecstatic. It was amazing that, that the reconnection with her and, and the hope that our life would go on. And I promised never again. And I meant it. And I meant it the next day. I meant it the next month, the next month. And sometimes it would go on for a half year that I didn't do anything. I would just cut off the people that cared about me, the people who I'd, I shared these sacred, intimate times with. I would just say, I'm done. I'm done writing. Eva found out and I need to focus on my marriage. I would just discard people, throw them away, and then maybe come back in four months when I needed them again. I didn't treat anybody very well. Um, I think there was a lot of falling in love on my side and their side, but at the end, I was a jerk and not worthy of love. I didn't love myself and I was looking for love in the wrong way. I was looking to fill gaps, definitely in the wrong way. I was using people as objects for my own you know, needs. And the way, and this was a cycle. Like I said, I, I meant it and I'd do it again. And I think after that happened twice and here I go in the third cycle, I kind of knew that it was, it's over. Like, like at some point, either she has to accept that I'm polyamorous and accept the whole thing, or I, I know that I know that there's an there's an expiration date on on our relationship. You know, I just know it. And toward the end of all this, after. You know, I'm saying it like it's years and years. It, it wasn't. I'm saying, I'm actually, I'm talking about a period of about four years, to be honest. Wild, crazy, insane. Four years of, of, of madness is what it was. And I decided that that I should try to get Eva pregnant because what if we, what if at in our mid-30s or later we end up breaking up and she never has a child and then I just leave her? That would that's not what I wanted. I loved I loved her. And I know she wanted a child. And maybe she was holding off because of me. Maybe I was being selfish that I I was so into my well, yeah, I know that, that to be ca the case. I was such a bad person at that time. I was into my own thrills and my own needs. And I didn't want a child to come mess that up, that whole system I had going. Totally insane, totally abusive to a woman who's who's only happy, probably, you know, if if she's gonna have at least one child in her life. So by age 34, for the very first time, I decided I'm going to try to get Eva pregnant. 
didn't ask her, didn't tell her. And, and sure enough, after that one time, after how many years together? Now we're talking about 17 years together. I got her pregnant. <laughs> Even while I had another lover, a serious lover, you know, a serious relationship with someone else that she didn't know about. And no plan for how I'm going to change or what we're going to do next. Now a baby's on the way. Not only that, we bought an, we bought an amazing apartment together. We we finally found a beautiful property with a view of Ko should say a balcony the size of a yard, and finished an amazing property. Um, got a new car, Rav Four diesel, and I had you know I had a career. I I was still doing software sales for you know enterprise software sales. I had a couple different jobs in the meantime, but. Um, on the outside, everything was fine. Everything was finally coming together. But the truth is, my life was a complete mess. And now there's a baby on the way. And I didn't know how I would how I would change or whether I would change, whether we'd make it or maybe I hoped we would. I never thought I was. I knew one thing: I was never going to leave Eva. So other than my secret world, I was a great person, right? No, I wasn't a great person. My energy and attention went into into deceit. And I was I was led down that path by someone who did not love me unconditionally, who wanted to change me. And I wanted to change myself, but but didn't know how. And I learned a lot from, and, and there's more to it after Ellie was born, after my daughter was born, my beautiful Isabella. Um, it didn't end. Different stuff happened. I'll tell you that in the next talk. But um, I wasn't a good person. You know, I, I stopped caring about um, anything, anything of principle. I was into art. I was into music and movies and beauty. And philosophy, philosophy, I'd love to talk about any idea. I, I, had, I was having fun, you know. I cared about relatives. I cared about everybody. Um, there was just this secret world that had gotten really big for me. And, I, and if you're still listening, I, 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 you're probably the only one, but... Um, it gets it gets wilder, and then it gets better. So we'll end this one here. <laughs>